Now, my great grandmother came to this neighborhood in 1919. She started with a little pizzeria in, in Harlem, and she used to come shopping up on Arthur Avenue, and she found this little empty store that we have at 2342. Six tables. She says to my grandfather, we're going to open a restaurant. That's how it started. America has always been a nation of immigrants who have traveled here in search of a life better than the one they left behind. But while many have called it a melting pot, newcomers from all over the world chose instead to retain their cultural identities, settling in a patchwork quilt of neighborhoods in cities across the country. Those are the ones that they had a real motivation sure. to come over here. They, they were leaving Italy, but they were coming over here not knowing the language, penniless, literally, and they survived. Those are the real pioneers. Many Italian immigrants wound up here on Arthur Avenue, a neighborhood in the North Bronx of New York City. Steeped in tradition, third, fourth, and even fifth generation business owners do things the same way as their ancestors. This neighborhood has been through many changes. But when times have been tough, these business owners, neighbors first, competitors second, have always found a way to survive and even thrive. Join us as we look through the eyes of a longtime resident, Lou Ferrarisi, and for the first time, major business owners in a roundtable discussion about how Arthur Avenue became known as the Little Italy in the Bronx. seven years old, I used to eat this pizza by the slice right out front, only on Saturday. His family used to have it outside in a little steamer, five cents a slice. Lou grew up on Ryer Avenue and 183rd Street in the Bronx with his brother and sister a few blocks from Arthur Avenue. Both of his parents were born in Bari, Italy and migrated to America in 1919. The avenue has changed since 1951, but the traditions are still there. Lou returns to the avenue quite frequently and still buys all of his groceries from the same merchants that his father bought from. My grandparents and your grandparents, yeah. they grew up together on the street. Oh, I know. They worked yeah. together, they vacationed together. That's right. They had good times together. Biancardi yeah. and Randazzo and my grandfather, sure. they were always together. Just by doing what they were doing, they showed this courage and motivation to better themselves. That's right. He came from Sicily. He had a big family too, about, um, there were about seven or eight brothers. Um, a couple of them came here, they jumped ship here and there and they made it over to, to the United States. And they were in the fish business in Italy. And they came here, I think they started over here on Arthur Avenue first. They came and they were, they were young, they were 20, 25 years old. Uh, not married at the time, and they struggled. They struggled for many years, um, but they persevered, and they, they were successful. My story is uh, my uncle, my father, they came from Washington. They were tailors by trade on the other side, and they came over here. They worked downtown Lower East Side as tailors, and their cousin knew about this neighborhood. They suggested that uh, they try their hand at you know, the grocery business. And they opened up in 1915. My grandparents were very involved with the parish, the Valley Mount Carmel, and of course, Grandma also used to help take care of foster children. They were, they were very involved. They, you know, love, I guess, love for the, the neighborhood, love for the church. And, and the children, know, they were, that's nice. They were a big, uh, big part of the... That's nice. What we have here today. Because I shop at the same stores my parents, my grandparents shopped at. I mean, Mr. Bogatti, uh, Mario tells me all the time about selling ravioli to my grandmother back probably when they first opened up in the 1930s. He still remembers her order from back then. And then my uh, father passed away in 46, 1946. And uh, my brothers came in. And then I came in in uh, 1959. You know, I've been here since, and now my son's a are in the business and uh, I give them a pretty much of a free hand. Uh, I think the old and the new work pretty well together. 
I got a lot of ideas from them. And they also got a lot of ideas from my uh, brothers. So they're doing pretty well. But there was a time when things weren't so good. The 60s. Right. The 60s, this neighborhood became the uh, South Bronx. The South Bronx was Tiffany Street at the time. This was the uh, North Bronx. This was But the banks redlined this neighborhood wow. because everything kept moving up. Uh, buildings were burning in the South Bronx. Insurance companies didn't want to insure us. If you wanted to get a loan, it was difficult to get a loan. Do you remember when, uh, in the 60s, when it really started to slow down this neighborhood, what happened? South of uh, 183rd, they tore all those private houses down, mm -hmm. took out, I don't know how many families, probably hundreds of families, Absolutely. which hurt Arthur Avenue. Mm -hmm. Of course, they were going to build a big hospital there, which they never did. Okay. We suffered by guilt through association. A good chunk of the Bronx went to hell. It's no secret. The Bronx was a sign of urban decay. And even though what happened in a large portion of the Bronx never happened here, people just stopped coming because it was the Bronx, not any particular neighborhood. As those fears sort of went away and the city made a big comeback over the last, well, I guess since like about the late 80s, 90s, whatever, people started coming down again. This is where they came. Following the economic downturn and neighborhood exodus of the 1960s, another group of newcomers came on the scene. Ethnic Albanians arrived in the city and were looking for work. Right. All the time. The, the, the new talk. generation of people who came to this country who wanted to make good. They and they became superintendents and then they, the whole family worked together. They all chipped in. They ended up buying buildings. They all worked for every one of us. Yeah. Many credit this new wave of immigrants with reviving the pulse of the neighborhood. Eventually, Arthur Avenue regained its good reputation and saw some familiar faces walking down its sidewalks again. I've noticed throughout the years that when times are bad, this neighborhood gets better. Arthur Avenue and the rest of New York City rebounded in the 1980s and 90s, but many who live and work here never left. Many of these shops and restaurants are operated the same way they have since they opened, with third, fourth, and even fifth generation owners at the helm. Arthur Avenue is known all over the tri-state area, and almost anyone you talk to, I think you'll have a hard time finding someone who knows Arthur Avenue and has something bad to say about it. So we've inherited that from our uh, parents and grandparents here that we could build on a name, that we could publicize and turn around and use to bring people here. This is Arthur Avenue today. Vibrant, alive with people traveling from the tri-state area to sample the many tastes and flavors of this old world neighborhood. Well, it is. So he's, he's the only original that's left in the market. 1936, he was in the street, in a push cart. 1940, Mayor LaGuardia opened up the retail market. And Joe is the only original. I think a lot of the older folks that were here and migrated to this neighborhood, their children went to school and to college, and they moved on, and they moved to Westchester, they moved to Connecticut, and they moved to Long Island, New Jersey. And then they start coming back. And who do they bring? Their neighbors. And the, That's right. the, uh, it keeps growing that way. Yeah, the children coming back, because maybe they heard the stories from their parents or their grandparents. So they're rediscovering where they came from, as well as well, everyone they, that passes through New York must hear of this area. And, and like I say, there's so many different people who come and, and shop the Arthur Avenue, 187th Street, and it's, I always say, it's, it's almost like a United Nations now. Oh, it's tradition. True. It's a flavor. And when it comes to traditions, none are more famous than the family-style dinners at Dominic's every Sunday afternoon. Hi. Morning, Al. Nice good, good, to nice to good to see you. Good to see you. Today we're in for a treat, Al. Oh, we're yeah. really going to be experiencing the Italian tradition uh -huh. and uh, a Sunday meal. Italian tradition, 
I look forward to you that. Look forward yeah. to it. Now, me being first generation Italian, I go way back to when my grandmother used to do this. And what it was, the, the, the importance of it is everything is fresh today. Ooh, and we're going to have a straight, a real traditional Italian meal, which for some reason, a lot of neighborhoods have lost it. Why they've lost it, many different reasons. Amazing. But this neighborhood so far has kept it together, and Let's hopefully hope. they'll keep yeah. it together for a long, long time. Good. Just want to introduce you. This is Al. Hi, nice and to and meet you. And, 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 and today, you're going to explain to us and show us a traditional Sunday meal at Dominic's. And we got it the past to him. We got it in Provolone with my fellow brother. We have fresh roasted peppers. We have salami. And the rest, we got a salad, the tomatoes, we got onions. We got a fresh egg and plant. We're going to make egg and parmesan. I got two great chefs with me in the morning. Then I got a two in the afternoon. Techniques, both in the kitchen and in the business, have been passed down from generation to generation. I fell on my wife and dropped everything and exactly in my, uh, my wife. I don't know speak English. I still don't speak English. He was a 62, he decided to retire, and he sold the place to me. I started working like a make mozzarella. I fell low with make mozzarella. I tried to find a little bit better. I went to Italy to try to find out what was the secret to the mozzarella. It was a little different from me, the way they used to make over here with Italy. A few little secrets. I bring it back here. And after that, everything went fine. I was lucky. I was, uh, I'd say thank you to Nikki because he gave me the chance and the opportunity to buy that place. I never forget that. My birthday is on April the 8th. And how old are you going to be? I'm going to be 100. I know, I feel like I'm 70. Well, I came up here in 1936 when they had the push carts over here on the street. I like to go dancing. I dance once a week yet. I entertain, I sing. Fairy tales can come true. It can happen to you if you don't get hard. I drive. drive. Still drive. Uh, drive. What kind of car do you have? Uh, I have a uh, Sable uh, 1999 Mercury. Wow. And a friend of mine said if he had to rob a bank, he would let me drive the car. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, the loudspeaker, Joe Biden, come off of that lot. So I, I shook. I, what happened? You know, I walk outside. There's a lot of a truck 58, 56 from the fire department. All the firemen are on the sidewalk, and they got a shirt for me, fire department, New York. And I turned around. There's Linda there. She just happened to stop my niece from Jersey. She took a picture. It was so delightful. I couldn't believe what was happening. It was unbelievable. So, uh, like I say, I got a lot of good memories. I've been coming here when I was keeping company with my wife. Her, her grandfather was the first one that gave me a shot when I was in business. I used to make uh, sarsaparilla, cream soda, Coca-Cola used to sell them. The bar was down in the corner there. I miss those days and a lot of friends that are not here today. So I thank God and East 187th Street of North Arabia, and our good old USA. All these guys here, once you, you know, you, you open a business, you could be there for 20 years and sell it and move on and retire. When you get a business from your father, who got it from his father, who got it from his father, it almost becomes like you got no right to change it anymore because they didn't change it. It's part of your home, it's what you do, it defines you as a person. And all these guys grew up you know, when their parents had the business and their grandparents before them, they grew up as kids working in the business with one another. We all help each other. Anybody needs anything, Charlie comes over, I need a tank of gas for the, for the silver, you got it. I go over, I need aluminum plates, he gives them to me. I go to Amelia's, uh, I needed uh, some bread one night, he gave it to me. He came over, he needed lobster tails one night, I love the tail. But we all help each other. And it's one family and everybody helps each other. But I think, you know, to get to the real basis of this conversation is what keeps this neighborhood together. I think number one, I think it's the church. Number two, I think it's the merchants. And number three, I think it's the people who interact with each other. It's like Joe and Charlie said that uh, 
we help each other out, we may be competitors, but in the final analysis, we're all here to make a living. What we do, we do together. And when somebody goes out of business, it's, it's not just uh, that everyone competes fairly, but when somebody goes out of business, it's a loss. Everyone feels it. Every time a business closes around here, people don't want to see anyone else go out of business. They'll it's help each other. It's like a death in the family. It's like a death in the family. That's exactly it. Yeah, everybody competes. Everyone does their best. Everyone wants to make a buck, and everyone does. But I don't think anyone wants to do it at the expense of seeing his neighbor go out of business. And that's why uh, whenever a store closes, people, uh, they mourn over it. They really do. That's part of the resilience of the neighborhood. It's a place of contradictions. A group of competitors who assist each other in the common interest of the community. An ethnic neighborhood that consists of people of many different heritages and backgrounds. A community steeped in tradition that remains flexible to the changing times, adapting, surviving, and ultimately succeeding. His key is his sauce. The best sauce. Everything. everything. The sauce is the sauce is just a type of tomato. But for instance, there was a, a fire in a bakery, a bread bakery, and the bakery was shut down. We had three, four other bakeries in the neighborhood. You, what another bakery did was they would bake, and then at the end of the night when they finished their run, they would hand the keys over to the bakery that had the fire so that they could do all their baking and continue selling while all their ovens were being repaired. Kept them in business. You know, I mean, that's what we have going on around here. I'd say if I'm a shopper, I'm not going to go back to a place where I had a bad experience. So you got to stick with, you know, like you say, something that works. And if it isn't broken, you don't fix it. That's the old right. saying I always hear from my father, my father-in-law. You don't fix something unless it's broken. But the thing is, like you say, it, it, it's, it's been doing well. Uh, the people have a great experience. Um, the it's neighborhood is it probably it's going in the right direction. And we got to keep it that way. And like I said, we got to make it uh, safe, we got to keep it clean, where someone's going to come back and have a great experience where they want to spend their money, because they'll say, hey, I could spend my money anywhere, I don't have to go there. It would be nice to get some maybe little nightclubs opening up, maybe some place with a little music, a little jazz, maybe some nice trendy cafes in the evening. You know, we have a, a built-in young population because of Fordham University that borders us. We have thousands of Fordham University students living in the community. Plus, a lot of students visit from one campus to another. We get students down here from Manhattan College and Iona College, and we get them coming up from Fordham in the city, as well as NYU and Columbia students coming up to the neighborhood to shop, to eat. It'd be nice to turn around and provide a little, little nightlife for them so we get a younger generation up here. I love everybody here. And the guys that are not here, that are still in the neighborhood together, we're all together, everybody's together with me. Okay, you don't hurt somebody. Stay strong. We stay strong. We're going to stay strong. After surviving many ups and downs for over a century, it's apparent that it's the people and customers who have helped this ethnic community not only survive, but grow and keep its traditions alive, allowing Arthur Avenue to live up to its name as the Little Italy in the Bronx. I start out with a little antipasto. You got this it. table, that table, and that table. Three tables, table, okay? yes. Then we're going to go to a little stuffed artichokes right. and, and uh, roast and stuffed peppers. You got Just it. Just wrap it up. Yes, sir. Then we're going to want the, the pasta special like okay. that and the meat special. Yes. And the gravy. So, okay. All three. Fine. Okay, and, and when you do the uh, brajo, slice. Slice it for okay. all three. You got it. Okay? No problem. Terrific. Thank Thanks, you. Patsy. I still don't speak English. So, it's <laughs> all right. The, the only thing I can do is one of the nicest, uh, nicest guys in the neighborhood. Come uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, don't hold me to turn around. Turn around. Don't hold me to turn around. I'm Frank Abagamo from Boston. and we, We're here at Arthur Avenue and having a great time. And very similar to my neighborhood. It's um, Little Italy, where I come from, North End, Boston. It's very similar. 
and uh, we want to keep the Italian tradition alive. Each table is going to get this. This is, this is family style. My name is Pasquale Caroleo, and I started to work on Dominique 1967. I think the people that they here already, they stick together. Everybody loves uh, Arturo. Oh, I personally have been going to that butcher shop since 1950. Wow. No way. We're not going anywhere. I heard a new joke I told to your father. It's a couple of ball players are uh, talking about whether there were any ball players up in heaven. They didn't know any. They made an agreement. Whoever went first to heaven would let the other one know. But finally, one of them died, went up to heaven, and the weak lady called his friend. He said, Mo, I got good news and bad news. He said, what is the good news? They have ball players up here. He says, so what's the band do? He says, you're pitching next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> This is traditional okay. for Easter. Okay. And right now we're in the, Le the, the Lillo's pastry oh. shop. No. He's a professional. Thanks, Patsy. Mel, do you think you can handle that? I got it all. No, we sell block chocolate. And a kid that I remember, my brother Benny used to, uh, when he was three, four years old, every time he came in, he gave him a piece of chocolate. Now the kid is uh, 19, 20 <laughs> years old. And he still remembers. So it, it's, uh, true. it's a tradition. It's, uh, it's a flavor. <laughs> I'm a jolly old man. I'm sound as a ring. I'll be a hundred years old with the coming of spring. I like to tell jokes, I sing and I dance. I'm a jolly old fellow and I can't tell a lie. And if the devil doesn't get me, I'll live till I die. <laughs> He's like a grandfather to me. We love him. <laughs> Thank you, Joe.